This week on Outdoor Oklahoma, we showcase an organization whose whole goal is to help recruit and mentor young hunters. Follow along and watch these kids experience their first deer hunt, which hopefully sparks a chain reaction of lifelong memories to come. Welcome to Outdoor Oklahoma. I'm Todd Craighead. And today I'm joined by Lance Meek, our Hunter Education Coordinator. Thanks for joining me, Lance. Glad to be here. You know, as the Hunter Education Coordinator, obviously you, you see a tremendous importance in our education program, but I guess even you would agree that another element that every hunter needs is someone to show them the ropes, too. You know, I, I think hunter education, I, I think everybody, whether it, it's required or not, I think it's a great idea to go to a hunter education class. And you're right, it's a great first step. You can go into a hunter education class and you can, you can learn the knowledge that you need in order to be a safe and ethical hunter. Mm -hmm. It's still up to you to apply that knowledge. And, and one thing that can be a great help is to find yourself a mentor. You know, and it doesn't have to be a parent or a grandparent, and although those were that was mine and it probably sure. was for you too but it can be a neighbor or a friend or you know somebody somebody you meet at a at your hunter ed class or something like sure. that well you know there was an organization that started up a few years ago that realized there was a need to try to hook people mentors up with with young people that did not have a mentor in their lives and so the Oklahoma youth hunting and shooting program was born a few years ago and today we're going to take a look at the tremendous good that they're doing across our state. Um, I'm here because I have two wonderful children that expressed an interest in uh, learning more about hunting. So I, uh, con I got on the internet, started Googling up <clears throat> any hunting and youth, anything I could find on hunting and youth associations in Oklahoma, and I came across the Oklahoma Youth Hunting and Shooting. Me and my little brother will we got picked to be one of the kids to be able to hunt, and we're just out here hunting, and it's really cool. My dad's like, you know, busy with his work, and so this came up, so he let me go on hunting with my mom and all of the others. And I was told, we've got some kids that need an experienced hunter, somebody that's had some time in the woods like you have, would you mind giving us one day? Would you mind coming out with us just one time? and? share some of your skills, you can't do it one time. And each time we give this gift to another child, the give back gives me more passion to share with more. So it's contagious. And that's really why we have Hunter's Ed right now, to teach that because there's a generation in there we lost sort of that bonding between a parent and a child in an outdoor environment. Uh, for whatever reason. So that group were not taught like my age group or by parents or grandparents. The Hunter Safety Course is just a great beginning place. It gives that basic level of instruction and certainly its focus is on safe handling of firearms. But that's all it is as a beginning point. There's a lot of knowledge that comes into play in pursuing this stuff and just learning how to safely handle a firearm is just the beginning. It's not Walt Disney out here. This is the real world and everything has its own life cycle and the more you know about that, the more you'll understand what's really going on out here and be able to pursue game effectively. We, we, have, we have the opportunity here to have several different things. One of the keys that, that, that I thought was so good about coming to the Woods Ranch 
is that they have the equestrian facility. And the fellow that runs that, when I was here a couple of months ago, says, well, if you have the time, we'll give the kid pilot lessons. Said, well, that's exciting. He said, yeah, in the equestrian shop, that's where you start is a pilot's lesson. A pilot's lesson. I don't understand. He says, you pile that manure in that pile, and then you get to ride. And so that is what we do now. We're going we're gonna to go hunting here in a couple of hours, kids. Who has earned the right to hunt? And they look at each other like, well, I was invited. I said, no, 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 you're invited to be here. Now to go hunt, we've got dishes, we've got cooking, we've got cleaning. We're about to go up to the blind and just wait for some deer to come up. Yeah. Last night, about five o'clock in the evening uh, I had the, the pleasure of sitting with my daughter in a blind and uh, with a wonderful guide John our guide uh, <clears throat> and he uh, did a dry run with my daughter on the use of the rifle or the gun that they were using it all boils down to this whole process culminates in a single shot and we have a responsibility to that game animal to make that shot as perfect as possible. And that boils down to the basic elements of placing an accurate shot with a rifle. So while we're in the blind, just to reinforce the lessons that they've learned on the range, we get into the blind as early as we can so that everyone can get settled in. And while we're kind of waiting for that prime time of game movement to come in, we'll work with the kids and go through the steps again and get them comfortable with the equipment and get all the shuffling and moving and readjusting and all that out of the way we can and try to make that one perfect shot that is the goal of this whole process. We set till Oh, approximately seven o'clock, maybe right at dusk. Um, and as we sat, we saw some just wonderful, spectacular views of Oklahoma. And we had, uh, after a little while, we had a doe come in to the far right of our blind that apparently noticed that there was a deer blind there that wasn't there the last time it came into that field, so it was. Its senses were pretty on pretty high alert, uh, and that's the point where we actually loaded a round of ammunition into the chamber of the rifle. First of all, we saw this nice doe, but right whenever I put my shells in, it ran off. And that unnatural metallic click of the bolt closing and the safety going on uh, spooked that one enough to where she vacated the premises. But that pretty well put everybody on high alert that okay, we're serious about this now and something's, there's a high likelihood of something happening. Pretty much right at sundown, we had a set of four does come in from basically right in front of us that were coming towards the blind and uh, you could tell that they were catching something in the wind because pretty much every one of them at one point or another had her nose up in the air sniffing big time and they were looking at the blind pretty hard but apparently decided it wasn't an issue. After a while 
We see this doe emerge right there in front of me. Actually, the nicer one of the four came out into the lead and into an open spot and presented a nice broadside. And I told Brooke that that's your shot if you're going to take it. And she just made a perfect shoulder shot that uh, and harvested her first deer. <laughs> when she made the shot, we stayed in the blind for a while to, because basically once the, the bullet impacted, the doe kind of spun and ran into the heavy grass back out into the open field that we had been uh, scouting. She got it spot on, right on the mark. I was so proud of her. Um, I just shot my first doe and we're going to go find it out in the pasture of tall grass. It's going to be fun. And we got just the rest of the group there about 15 minutes after she shot it, and they were so excited for her. Everyone got out there and combed that field of high grass and thick brush, and they found it for her, and she got her first doe, and I am just tickled pink about it. We, we were about to give up, until some more people came up and we finally found her. Oh, well, we just found my doe that we were basically about to give up until they arrived. All right. Thank you. Did yeah. you shoot them in the same spot I shot mine? I was gonna shoot, like, no, it was facing toward the chest. Oh, so yeah, I was at the chest, cool. but then right whenever my mom, like, first, I shot it. Congratulations, you all. It turned. Nice. All right. See, I told you it yeah. turned. Yeah. Good job. Thank you. Good Good job. Job. Well, Great sure. job. Can't say you never give up, but <laughs> you certainly don't without spending every available resource to track down a, a dead or wounded animal. Because it, it's all back to, we're all part of that bigger cycle. And in my mind, we owe it to that animal. I mean, you've just killed something for the purpose of putting it in the freezer and feeding your family. and. If nothing else, you owe it the respect of expending every possible effort to make sure that that life wasn't wasted. Yeah, I have a son, and I was really expecting that, hoping that today I'd go out with him and I could see him get his first doe. And Bo got that deer right on the mark, too. So both of my children, I'm very fortunate, both of my children got two doe last night, beautiful doe. And uh, they're just tickled pink, and they got right in the action, and. Uh, uh, they helped gut it and skin it and just like it's second hand, you know, just like they've done it all their life. And I know the youth uh, will remember their first harvest as I have remembered my first harvest and that was like 60 years ago, uh, 70 years ago. It, uh, it's, a, it's a memory that to me is cherished so you're building memories, and that's and, and they're good memories. Got some does off the place. Kids got them first deer. And that's what it's all about. It was a really good time, even for the ones that didn't get the deer. They had a good time. Nothing, nothing better. Roller coasters don't even get enough for adrenaline rush. You know, this this goes way beyond a roller coaster or any kind of ride you've ever been on. I want to thank my mom for letting me come down here and having fun and let me enjoy this. It was a great opportunity and I had fun shooting my first deer. Thanks dad for bringing me out here and having a great time. After supper Saturday night, we have a campfire and everybody around the, in the group gets up and uh, discusses how they became involved with the group, what they've uh, 
learned and on a specific hunt. Uh, this is my fourth year, fourth year doing it, fourth year doing it, and uh, I do a lot of hunts every year personally, but this is the funnest hunt that I do every year. Taking these kids hunting, seeing them shoot the first deer, it's the funnest thing I do every year. The one common denominator is the fact that you have, in a lot of cases, a parent bonding with a kid where they've been involved in working two jobs and don't spend enough time trying to make a living for the family, but they're losing that other valuable time bonding with their children. And in a lot of cases, it's a reverse. A child is excited that they're being able to spend time with their parent who has been working two jobs. So it, you'll get a lot of emotions in these meetings. And uh, it, it just, it's very moving. The, the Oklahoma Youth Hunt Shooting Program is statewide. This one happens to be the largest because of the facility. We have 10 hunters. We actually had 120 qualified hunters this season. We have only probably 35 out, and I think we're on seven different ranches today. The bottleneck, the thing that keeps us from doing 120, are volunteers. We need experienced hunters, and we, we could fill as many as we needed. The screening is very, very tough. The background check is very, very tight and it's not just casual, random people that stop by that get to be involved in the program. It, it, takes, it takes dedication and it takes an absolute spotless background. You don't have to be an attorney, though we have several. You don't have to be a captain of industry, though we do have a few. You don't have to be a photographer or a writer, though we have those as well. You have to have a passion, you have to have a clean background, and we never let our, guard, we never let our volunteers go with a hunter without a guardian involved. So once you make it into the program, it's fabulous. When my kids left the house and I needed to, to expand my hunting into something that, that I could share the passion more, this fit perfectly and that's what we look for now. We look for more volunteers. We, I, it would be surprising that we couldn't grow this to four or five hundred kids a season with enough volunteers. I can personally tell you that the time I've spent mentoring someone else has been one of the most rewarding things I've ever done in my life whether it's my own daughter or it's a friend's son, the time that you invest in someone else's life is so worth it. And the good news is, well, you don't have to be an expert to be a mentor. You just have to be willing to give of your time. Over the years, there's a few folks that I've considered my mentors. And every time I show a, a new hunter the ropes, well, it's kind of like I'm paying back the debt to those that invested in me. Let's switch gears now and talk about another issue that plagues the future of hunting in our country, and that's habitat loss. And one wildlife species in particular has had a rough go over it in recent years. The lesser prairie chicken has declined so rapidly that it has biologists all over the western United States working together to find a solution before it's too late. The Western Association of Fish and Wildlife Agencies, of which Oklahoma is a member, is working on solutions that help benefit industry leaders, private landowners, and ultimately us all. And once again, the future of the lesser prairie chicken is looking bright. My granddad bought the southern part of this ranch in 1941. Back in the 50s and 60s, uh, you could ride a horse about anywhere you wanted to on the ranch, and you'd see a lot of prairie chickens out here. It's a real common thing. But now that some of that mesquite has gotten so thick and so big that it's just nearly impossible to ride a horse through it. The native prairie that, that used to exist disappeared because of fire suppression and more uniform and heavier grazing. Uh, we began to see more of a monoculture of vegetation. We also started to see encroachment of some of those uh, fire intolerant species like mesquite. Prairie chickens show an aversion to any type of vertical structure like that on the landscape. And so those native rangelands that used to provide prime habitat for the species have become unusable over time. The Western Association of Fish and Wildlife Agencies began developing a collaborative conservation plan to try and stave off the federal listing of the lesser prairie chicken uh, by establishing and growing populations. 
the Lesser Prairie Chicken Range Ride Plan is a collaborative effort with many different government and private conservation agencies and organizations and through agreements with private landowners. We implement prescribed grazing as the core conservation practice. Uh, landowners also receive an annual payment for implementing that prescribed grazing plan for the term of their agreement. And we also address all the other threats to the species that occur on each of those properties. We deliver restoration practices such as grubbing of mesquite, uh, chemical suppression of shinnery oak, and then we deliver a payment to the landowner equivalent to the actual cost to implement those practices. The development in the region, oil and gas, wind, solar, electric transmission and distribution, and telecommunications. All of those also have effects on prairie chickens by adding vertical structure, adding noise, adding traffic. What the range-wide plan really does is try to focus that development in places that reduce the impact to prairie chickens. One of the reasons that it was a good idea for us to join into this WAFWA effort was uh, because they help us uh, select places that are less impactful to the chicken first, but it, on places that we just can't avoid them, they also help us with the design and, and offsets so that if we impact the chicken in this place, they get double the habitat elsewhere. The farmers and ranchers are an important component of this because 96% of prairie chicken habitat across the range is private land. The industry money pays those landowners to make improvements on their property that not only improve prairie chicken habitat, but also farming and ranching. We decided this would be a good program for this ranch and we've had, you know, the shinery was just a, nearly a 100% canopy out here and the grass was uh, pretty limited. And by when we went in there and sprayed this shimmery, well, we just turned it to a tall grass prairie, like it's similar to what it should have been historically. We've uh, sprayed about uh, 8,000 acres of shinnery, and we're in the process of grubbing around 8,000 acres of uh, mesquite land. And uh, we converted our uh, grass uh, production from about 400 pounds of grass per acre to 12 to 1,600 pounds of grass per acre. The ultimate goal of the range-wide plan is to manage for sustainable populations of lesser prairie chickens and to maintain the industry and economy throughout the region. You know, Pioneer jumped into this program with about 170 other companies um, because it was the ability to control our own, own fate. Voluntarily, we were able to jump in and do some things that would allow us to have some predictability with our future. And since we've started this wildlife program, it allowed more grass to grow, and we're starting to see chickens. It's one of those things that's been good for us financially. It's been good for the, for the land and for the cattle, and well, this is a kind of a dream come true. For more information about the great work being done by the Western Association of Fish and Wildlife Agencies, look them up online. And if you're a concerned landowner in Oklahoma, well, we'd encourage you to get in touch with one of our private landowner biologists today. If you've been as lucky as I have, and were raised in a hunting and fishing family, and you've gone through shotgun and rifle and bow, and you're looking for that next step, that step is sharing, that next step is giving, that passion to somebody else. If you're a parent of a kid that cannot find a way to find the uncle or the grandpa to take you, give us a call. We are that avenue. We're experienced hunters, we're dedicated people to the outdoors, and we'd love to share that with you. And if you have the same background that we do and you want to share your passion, you owe it to yourself to give us a call because this will not only change a kid's life and their family's life, it will change your life. Come on out with us. We could use your help. Well, Lance, as we mentioned, hunter education is one of those vital steps in becoming a hunter. Well, I sure think so, Todd. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, I, I agree. It's really important. Um, you know, you can purchase an apprentice license in some cases, mm -hmm. and that makes the mentor even more important. It's actually required by law. Right. But I think whether you purchase that apprentice license or not, you should, um, you should take a hunter education class. 
and you know it's easier than ever these days it's free you know you've got three different option options for that mm -hmm. you can take the traditional eight hour class mm -hmm. you can take a home study class where you do some of the work at home and then you only have to come to four hours of class and you can actually take the entire class if you're an oklahoma resident 10 years of age or older you can take the entire uh, class online these days that's great it is and and you know i'd say anybody out there if you're already a hunter you need to take somebody new hunting this year. Be a mentor yourself. Absolutely. Thanks for joining us, everybody. We encourage you to connect with us on Facebook and Twitter and keep up with your wildlife department. We'll see you right here next time on Outdoor Oklahoma.